Hey everyone, so the last time we checked in with James Tour, he was busy soiling himself on the Harvard campus where his intellectual superiors politely mocked him for two hours about his slander and apologetics. You won't be surprised that he didn't learn his lesson at all, and he's back with some desperate damage control to shake off the humiliation. So hop on board and let's head to Tourville. If you haven't seen my video about the Harvard event, you really should watch that first for context, and for the sheer delight of watching James squirm like a toddler while being pressed repeatedly to defend his pathetic antics. I, I don't think that anybody's out to scam, intentionally scamming people. Origin of life research is a scam! If you're up to speed, his next move won't be terribly surprising. He released this video called Harvard Debate Review. Atheist scientist defends James Tour and debunks Lee Cronin's assembly theory. So there's a lot to unpack with the title alone. First, James is pretending it was a debate when it wasn't. It was a Cambridge faculty roundtable. They each made short statements up top, then they sat at a table and talked casually over dinner with other scientists, and then they were asked questions on a panel. That's not how debates work. It was never a debate. They were both invited to the Cambridge Faculty Roundtable series, a thing that has existed for a long time and is definitely not nor has ever been a debate-style event. The reason James pretends it was a debate is that he made a fool of himself in his debate with me, so he is pretending that this was a debate and that he won it. And because it wasn't a debate, it's difficult for him to concretely address anything that was formally discussed, so instead he decides to attack Lee. First, he will pretend that Lee was supposed to answer his ridiculous challenge that nobody cares about, which Lee explicitly stated he wasn't there to do. Then he will try to denigrate Lee's research with the help of an atheist scientist, as if to flat out admit that the club of Christian apologists he belongs to can't be trusted under any circumstance, thereby making the distinction necessary. This doesn't help James whatsoever, because the validity of Lee's work does not in any way represent the entire origin of life community, nor would falsifying it validate his script of lies. He's just being a sleazy charlatan. Anyway, in a moment we will speak with Lee because he felt compelled to respond to these accusations you're about to hear. We will also talk about Jim's pathetic challenge because he never shuts up about it no matter how many times I debunk him, so we can finally put that to rest. But first, let's go through some of the video. Here is the esteemed atheist scientist, Hector Zenil. It's actually kind of sad to have to clarify this, but I feel Professor Tour is also attacked because of his personal beliefs and that is, uh, I think, wrong. Oh boy, off to a bad start, Hector. No, James is attacked because he lies all over the internet about science he doesn't like, slandering Nobel Prize winners in the process. Not because he's religious, like thousands of other religious scientists who nobody attacks because they don't lie about science. It seems like you haven't watched any of my content exposing his lies. I think science communicators have a very hard time seeing behind titles and unfounded claims. That's the title of the paper, so you're wrong and lying, you know. Those science communicators may be able to refute unsophisticated charlatans like La Terre but they wouldn't be able to call out sophisticated deceivers. It quickly becomes painfully obvious that Hector has been primed with the Discovery Institute script. Hey Hector, I specifically expose sophisticated deceivers. That's what James is. That's how I showed the world that whenever he uses technical terminology or discusses primary scientific literature, he's just lying. That's why James has stopped even trying to respond to my content and why he won't even mention me by name anymore. That's how much I've ruined this for him. Now a word from James. Uh, I was accused by, by Lee Cronin of, of shouting and, and hurting people's ears. So problems are something we should embrace, not shout at relentlessly to say everyone's an idiot. I wasn't shouting. I've gone back and watched my 20-minute presentation twice. I mean, that's just Jim Tour. That's who I am. He's talking about this, genius. Mr. Farina! Mr. Farina! Mr. Farina! Zero! You can stop pretending this isn't who you are. Everybody knows this is what's bubbling under the surface 24-7 as your fragile ego wrestles with reality on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. I had agreed with the organizers because they were afraid that, that I'd, I'd take over the conversation. I said, 
After my talk, I will say nothing unless I'm asked a question. And you will see, I never responded. I never initiated anything. I just sat at that table. And unless a question came to me, I didn't say it. And I also said I wouldn't interrupt anybody. And so if they interrupted me, I would yield to them. And uh, uh, just so that you know the background on that. Yes, James was invited to a roundtable discussion, and he promised the organizers that he wouldn't say anything at the roundtable. That's totally how roundtables work. This isn't just his excuse for not having anything intelligent to say at the roundtable. Uh, I never speak online with YouTubers or influencers like the authors of um, Assembly Theory do all the time. Uh, I'm very selective, and uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Well, Hector, you actually are currently speaking with a YouTuber about the origin of life, because in this field, that's what James is. He doesn't work in the field, does not publish in the field, does not understand the field, and exclusively lies about it. So you should feel very embarrassed that you agreed to this. It's a terrible look. Anyway, from this point, he begins talking about assembly theory, so my commentary will stop here. Everything Hector said up until this point was complete garbage that he was almost certainly forced to say in exchange for James giving him access to his platform to attack Lee. The rest of the video is beyond my pay grade and mission statement. I'm here to expose James and his script of lies, and the rest of the video has absolutely nothing to do with that. Hector has some personal animus with Lee and wants to denigrate his work, which is why he found an audience with James who is desperate for anything he can spin into a win. But as far as assembly theory goes, I have no stock in it, so I will let Lee defend it. But as a viewer, you deserve at least a shred of context, so here are a few snippets that will help you navigate my conversation with Lee. First question, are there any new ideas? I think um, if there are any, they are very limited, because almost word by word, um, I believe they are taking much of the content from an area that is called algorithmic information theory uh, that has its own indexes. Um, Colmorph complexity is one of them. Algorithmic probability is another one that is deeply related. And another one that is called logical depth that was introduced by Charles Bennett, of which you can see two papers on the screen. And this concept was introduced in the 80s and is basically exactly about trying to find the causal history of an, ob of an object by applying some sort of uh, statistical and algorithmic index, which in this case is called um, logical depth. One of the tricks of assembly theory, if you see it as some sort of, some sort of deception, I'm, I'm going to make the case of why I think it is. I think it wasn't a deception at the beginning, but now it is becoming one when they are being represented with evidence that it is actually the contrary, that, that it is not a contribution. But I think the strategy has been to mix full or half truths um, with non-truths. And the truths are so obvious and undisputed that they give some sort of uh, credibility to the deceptive content. So for example, when they talk about the combinatorial argument regarding how nature comes up with these highly structured um, entities, their explanation is not different than algorithmic probability. All right, so that's a quick primer on what Hector says. The short version is that he's basically accusing Lee of plagiarism, which is a very serious accusation. And he talks for nearly an hour while James just nods his head, pretending to have a clue what he's talking about. Rest assured, he does not, and his viewers couldn't care less. The whole video could have been three words, Lee is fraud, and they would jump for joy, as though even if it were true, it would somehow validate Jim's script of lies. But I promised Lee an opportunity to respond to all this, so here's that conversation now. Uh, okay, so I watched, or at least I skimmed uh, what Hector said about you, and it's some pretty serious, uh, he seems pretty angry, some allegations here. Uh, I just wanted to give you a chance to respond, kind of however you want, you can, you can just start as you please, I suppose. Um, I don't really think it merits a response. He's not a serious scientist. He's not a serious individual. He mm -hmm. contacted me many years ago uh, wanting to collaborate. I, I thought, oh, that was interesting. I engaged with him for some time. It then came very clear that he had some, let's say, ego issues. And then when he started to hector explain me, I I decided because he couldn't put things in words that I could understand that 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 it, it wasn't worth engaging with and it was quite you know disappointing but then anyway he came back again and then he then he started to make things up online where he just made up things I said in emails to him so then I realized he wasn't particularly stable and just emailed him and said it's probably not a good idea you do this and left it. And that was in a completely different area. And then when uh, all I would say is now he's, he's confusing about a number of different things. So 
to it, those of, and I don't want to have a debate with him because he's not useful and I think it's detrimental to my uh, my collaborators and my students and so on, but let me just address three things quickly. He doesn't know the difference between a theory and an algorithm. He, he doesn't understand that uh, algorithmic information theory is a theory principally about how understanding how long programs will run on computers. Super important area of information technology, super important mathematics, super important within these things. And there's, a, there's several measures. There's Komogorov complexity, which tells you about the shortest program you could write, you could to, you, to, to, to output a given piece of data. And there's another thing called logical depth, which is about the runtime of the program to generate the data. So one's about program size and one's about time. So you kind of get the general gist. Then yeah. there are compression algorithms, encoding algorithms, one called Lempel's if, and there is an encoding scheme called Huffman encoding. And what he basically fixates on is the fact that the assembly, the way we calculate the assembly index has some looks compressed and looks like Lempel's if and Huffman and does a load of technical stuff. And sure, superficially, if you don't understand causation, then they would look very similar. Uh, well, no, no, they don't look very similar. They superficially have some common things that you could represent things in a string and break them down and look for repeat units. But there is a number of important things to kind of say. The first is that assembly theory is about the minimum path to construct a physical object in the absence of the, any knowledge of mathematics, Turing machines, um, information, uh, algorithmic information theory and all that stuff. And that the assembly theory is about selection in the universe. It's not about understanding compression algorithms. And it's a bit like him saying, oh, this algorithm looks similar to your algorithm. But assembly theory isn't an algorithm. It's a theory that explains the emergence of selection. And so all this obfuscation the only person who would give him a uh, airtime is is the creationist Jim Tor. So yeah, for I guess that, yeah. that speaks for itself. And there's kind of a couple of other further things to quickly say. Okay. We can measure the assembly index directly um, from molecules. We can measure selection uh, directly. We can also do experiments that with assembly theory as a framework, you wouldn't be able to do beforehand. So the whole idea of a theory is an explanatory framework that gives you reach to do something new you wouldn't already do. And nothing that Hector says. And then he stoops so low to say, oh, so he started off saying it's nonsense, um, wrong and trivial. And by the way, I did it also one year right, before. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but actually, well, you'd even read the literature correctly, because even if it had any comparison a year before in the very same journal, we published the fundamental um, first um, kind of written, uh, you know, peer reviewed in 2017 uh, um, a paper on which was called then pathway complexity. But that's kind of as much airtime as I want to give it. It's mm -hmm. very unfortunate. I wish him no ill. I will not interact with him. I know he keeps going around saying that I'm just making stuff up and there's some bullshit asymmetric principle. But the only bullshit asymmetric principle was the length that he's going to to go cultivate his information followers. That I mean, why would we just basically trying, you know, first of all, we didn't read the literature, then we plagiarized the literature literature, and now we are fabricating the literature. Right. I mean it's a so, lot of conflicting. I mean, the the my my takeaway was that like he seemed to be talking exclusively about like coding and compression and these kinds of things. And I know essentially nothing about computer science, so it's very difficult for me to comment on that. But the, I I don't like, and I understand how that has application to like you know you're talking about biosignatures and things like that. But when in at the Harvard thing, you were talking about you were making an analogy about Roman arches and like scaffolding and like these layers and to me like i'm i i like thinking about molecules and so that was making me think about my prior conceptions about like first a series of like dipeptides tripeptides very short oligonucleotides very simple catalytic behavior then be getting a, a more complex set and set. so it's like i'm thinking about molecules he's talking exclusively about computer science terminology 
you know, I, I don't see the connection. I don't understand computer science, so I, I can't really comment. But uh, I mean, that seemed like a red flag. And then the other red flag is that I kind of looked around and looked for, wh who, you know, people who were criticizing the paper. And some people were talking about that they didn't like the title or there was like a sentence in the abstract they didn't like about the uh, evolution and physics. And uh, there, there were some semantics there, but I didn't see anybody else echoing like these very bold claims of, of plagiarism. I mean, like if there was validity to that, I feel like other people would also be saying that. But really all the criticism I found was seemed to be relatively constructive and and not not as outlandish uh, as that. So. These are the red flags that make me think that this is not that there's no validity to to this attack, but uh, it's hard for me to say. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't expect. I mean, like the anything as I've said. Apparently, by saying this now, I'm also a charlatan by saying we all make mistakes in science. What we do is propose ideas and we explore those ideas against experiment conjecture and see how it allows us to do new things. But the other thing I'll say is like one of the premier institutes on the planet, the Santa Fe Institutes. Um, for complexity theory. I presented assembly theory there. We've got working groups there. Two of my co-authors are professors at the Santa Fe Institute. And so, you know, I don't know if anyone, I don't think anyone should be able to take that. Because also the other thing that's happened is Chur over-credentialized Zanil. He, he has a position in Oxford, not clear. I think he had the Phillips. Has a position in Cambridge, not clear. Right? He has an Oxford email address. He is in the Turing Institute. He's not anymore. They were kind of visiting, just giving out. He's this, there, and everywhere. He's got double degrees. When people credentialize themselves like that, yet they don't do any serious science, and all they do is troll other people or publish yeah. book chapters in very poor papers, then you, and poor, as I mean by, um, in very in very obscure journals, saying seeming to be incorrect, um, it's it's kind of it just it it just is an, another red flag for me. So I think the fact that he's kind of jumped on this and that it's it's just yeah, like I say, I don't want to give him the light of day. It's outrageous. No. I feel sorry for him. Um, and you know, we're just going to get on. At the end of the day, criticism is good. And if it, if he can find some actionable criticism, that would be great because it's improving the theory. But if, yeah. You know, if, if it's the creationist and the crazy per, kind of person who has it in for me because they don't like me kind of get together for this nexus of against assembly theory, yeah. then I guess, you know, yeah, it's I mean, fine. To, to me, that's the biggest red flag of all is like I'm not a, I'm not able to assess how good assembly theory is. I'm not able to comment on, on what he talks about with compression. But these, this is a conversation for the primary literature or a more professional circle. The fact that he airs these grievances on the channel of a known creationist troll, it's just uh, what wh how do you make yourself look more unprofessional than that? It's just hard to, you know, yeah, yeah. that's really all that, that's all I can say about it. I wanted to give you the opportunity to say anything you wanted to say about it. Um, do you want to pivot now or do you? Do you yeah, I think so. I mean, like I say, I'm. All, I would don't, just want to re-emphasize, all criticism is good. I actually spent quite a long time trying to work out if there was anything actionable. Um, and we've got a couple of things coming out that shows that counterexamples for assembly index and Huffman encoding and mm -hmm. um, Lempel Ziff that show it's not either of them. And if you've got two, in mathematics, if you've got two counterexamples, then him saying it's a trivial form of this and you show the counterexample, it just kills it dead. Um, and there's actually a paper out there that already does it, one of my former postdocs who started his own research career on assembly theory. So so let's pivot on to yeah. our mutual acquaintance. Yes. So uh, for me, so watching the Harvard event was delightful. It was just, it made me so happy to watch uh, everybody very politely, much more politely than me, sort of, uh, you know, dunk on James a little bit. But the thing that was a little disappointing is that I knew that James was presenting this as a debate. He wanted to frame it as a debate, even though it wasn't. It was the Cambridge faculty roundtable, right? But um, you weren't there to to acknowledge his challenge. Uh, it which why should you? Uh, but he obviously inevitably is going to try to spin this as see, like they can't answer my challenge. So I wanted to put it to bed a little bit and have us, uh, you know, have you talk a little bit about his ridiculous challenge just so that uh, we can 
uh, put a pin in that as well. I, yeah, and let me give you a little bit of background to the debate. They contacted me and initially I said no, and that I didn't want to do it. And then I thought, well, okay, the people that were doing it funded by the Templeton um, Foundation, and the foundation has a very wide um, remit for funding from theology to science. And some people say that it's, that it's bad. I don't necessarily agree. I think organizations can fund whatever they want as long as they don't force me to believe it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the and also there is quite a, I think this was a, I don't want to, 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 mis, to misquote, but it seemed to be that a lot of Relig Christian scientists or scientists of other religious beliefs went to that round table and they're re referable, re really reputable, high ranking people and they just haven't had faith. And as long as someone of faith doesn't force me to listen to that day in, day out and tell me what that means, I kind of take the Christopher Hitchens approach, which is you can think whatever you want in your head, just don't force me to think it as well. So I thought, okay, I would go along. But then I kept getting all these emails and they were so inefficient and I didn't, I knew something was wrong. And when I queried and they said, oh, we're going to be recording it, I was like, no, there is no way this is going to be recorded unless we have joint editorial control. And they said, no, no, that's not allowed. And in the end, I, I settled on the fact that, okay, if you really want to record it, live stream it. So you mm -hmm. can't doctor it. Yeah. So it's all out there. And um, and 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 Jim, when we'll actually, it seemed he didn't like that very much, and he seemed to didn't go down very well. Why the attack of going come on? He's saying things like, "I would only come if he had to shut up." That's not was not the case. I didn't. He was terrified of saying anything wrong because he couldn't doctor it. I guess. Yep. I came along. I was terrified myself because I did, I didn't want to engage with him and give his creationist agenda any air but i wanted to actually talk about what i thought was an interesting problem where origin of life researchers are making great progress and so from that point of view i just stuck to my guns and i tried to be as you know yeah. congenial as possible but yeah but that's you that's the to background talk about your research which you're why wouldn't you right and uh, i think that james and the discovery institute thought that with with scholars of faith there that they'd be more on his side than they ended up being and they were all just dogpiling on him which was hilarious um okay so anyway let's just yeah i, I have his little challenge memorized at this point because i've debunked it like 50 times so number one polypeptides we're clueless about polypeptides are we no of course not and the paper he dumped on that he said was absolute garbage in debate he said a couple of interesting things he said there's no way you can have linear um, polypeptides there that all the side chains react, would react. That's actually wrong. In Of course, they do react. It's a combinatorial gamish. It's a terrible mess. But actually, the nice thing is by having these, so what we did in this experiment, and at the, at the beginning, actually, my, you know, my team got a kind of people going, you know, this won't work. You, you need to activate the formation of peptides, uh, sorry, amino acids form peptides. I said, well, Let's try it, take them to dryness and see what happens in different minerals. So the, the experiment's really simple. Put amino acids in glass vials, heat them to dryness, add water, heat them to dryness, continue yeah. on, what do you get? Do you get things decomposing? Because we did this in oxygen as well, right? This like it was reacting, going brown and the steam coming out. It was a mess. But within that mess, we saw linear chains and quite high concentrations, detectable concentrations by mass spec. And we didn't make those things up. You can go to the mass spec date, the supplementary data, and then fit them. So for him to say it was garbage, I was kind of, it was like, I didn't it's understand down. the showmanship there because it, it was a, a kind of a lie, which was like, I'm shocking from. So yes, of course you can make polypeptides by reacting together amino acids. What I don't think is so easy is to, go from a primordial soup to polypeptides without some selection, which I'm really interested in. I had to add in, you know, pure amino acids and James would jump on that and say, see, that's an evidence of, you know, a big problem. I'm like, well, no, it's evidence that selection has to operate far earlier in a primordial soup, which inevitably it has to. 
And, and I think that this then kind of goes easily into the polynucleotides and say, we can't generate polynucleotides spontaneously. Well, again, that's incorrect because in the Miller-Urey experiment, we start to see the very same components um, that we see, you know, um, it, the equivalent in the polypeptides in the, in the Miller-Urey. Again, they're in trace amounts and they're not forming beautiful um, oligomers, but you wouldn't expect them to. And the fact you can take to get to take mononucleotides uh, and cause them react to form di, tri, tetranucleotides, and indeed they can template themselves, again, is well known. And so I'm just like, I didn't understand the context of the challenge. Right. It was Wet dry cycling, the polymerization on clay for both of these uh, biomolecules. This has been well known for decades. So, and and he knows that. So that's why. Let's just get very specific about these first two challenges. So I've already elucidated the dishonesty here. But for the first one, it, he he puts clueless next to polynucleotides or sorry uh, polypeptides, even though we've been discussing wet dry cycling and all these ways you get polypeptides. But he wants this very specific DK linkage. So is that is that reasonable to uh, to ex to ask exclusively for this uh, specific linkage? I, I I mean I I don't understand. You're going to have all the linkages. They're all going to be possible in the absence of selection in a primordial soup. Nothing is off limits. Mm -hmm. The problem is how deep do you get into the chemical space before you see what you see in cells? But that's because evolution has to kick in. So no, I just I was just completely dumbfounded. And when he went. Uh, you know, in the Harvard round table to say, I predict Lee's not going to talk about chemistry. It's like, no one in the audience is a chemist. Why am I going to bore these poor people at dinner about the detailed chemistry that we have to do in our laboratories? And it's a bit like saying, you know, I am, I, here's how you make a nuclear reactor. I'm going to tell you about all the moderators, the type of graphite you're going to use, the speed. It made no sense to do that. So his challenge was a complete... Not a chemistry conference. Yeah. I mean, and you know, and it, and it's it's the bigger challenge was to convince a really large way, a large um, sleuth um, segment of of academics who worked at Harvard, who have faith from computer science. I met the director of IBM research, like the director of IBM research for arguably some thirty years of the most profitable uh, time there that IBM was as a company. The mathematician, a mathematician who was sitting next to me, and, and the physicist who 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 was really laser focused on asking James some tough questions. These were not trivial intellects by any means, but they weren't deep chemists. So to kind of bore them with this seemed, when it's detailed and not obfuscation, when I wanted to talk about far more fundamental theory which was the theory that explains selection, which explains how the chemistry that we choose is kind of arbitrary because of selection. And then you can go through these into polysaccharides, polysaccharides known in the foremost reaction. So not just the linkages in the polypeptides and the specifics of the chemistry that gives you the nucleosides, nucleotides, but then the polysaccharides. And of course, the detailed chemistry that occurs there's a vast combinatorial explosion. So there's many possibilities. In a cell, that combinatorial explosion is eliminated by the proteins and the history present. And the question I was really interested in explaining to people was like this, how do mixtures become more complex and less confusing? The very opposite of what James was saying. He keeps saying molecules crawl away from life. That's yeah. actually not true. They're sentient <laughs> and resist being incorporated into life. Yeah. Just, and so, and there's a kind of, there was a, there's a serious um, issue that he is neglecting. And this is one of stability that he has R. But the very thing that he talks about, the instability, the fact that molecules decompose is the very driving force that enables right. selection to occur. Because if you view this, let's just say, in my primordial soup, I have a quantity of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen molecules, very simple. The molecules combine and undergo a combinatorial explosion and react. So the simple molecules become, become more labored and less able to react. And then what happens, right? They, they just basically combinatorial explode and then they stop. The only way the system can go is because the system, because the linkages are unstable, it recycles building blocks. 
those building blocks fall into the mess mm. and some of the mess happens to catalyze the formation of new things. This is where the Roman arches come from. That we and talk about assembly theory. Discrepancies in their stability, there's, it's not all identical. So yeah, there's an element of selection there with the wet dry cycling. That's why the other origin of life researchers I talk to, they talk about, they use biological terminology to describe wet dry cycling, like, uh, like uh, generations, right? With these each day that uh, some break down, some build back up. So, yeah, I don't know. He knows that he knows uh, that all this research is there. So he pretends that you need the DK linkage, which you don't necessarily need for life to arise. And that's why I hit him with the pounder paper that got the coupling with the side chains anyway. And he just pretended that it wasn't valid. Um, and then the polynucleotide thing, he's he's um, wants exclusively three prime, five prime linkage, which is why I hit him with the Shaw stack paper that shows that you don't need that. And he just flounders about that again. And then the polysaccharides. He says, uh, I say, well, you could uh, like uh, catalytic activity, right? Enzymes can make polysaccharides. He says you can't get the enzymes because he was lying about the previous two points. So, that's so well, the three, the three prime, five prime thing is, is completely trivial in that you can get away with that. There's other things that happen. In fact, there's, there's many other configurations that give rise to information transfer. What happens is it's just not as efficient. So through rounds of evolution, basically most the most efficient um, kind of linkages get promoted. So kind of what you have is, I guess, let's see, I, I remembered them now, damn it. I mean, it's like, I want to empty, it's like, I, that's the only rent-free tour is having in my head. So if you go from peptides to, nucleic, to polynucleotides, polysaccharides, and then you start to have information in the emergence of the cell, well, they're all actually connected together. And it, you should start at the base. And this is why James is doing it the wrong way around. And I liken it like this. Imagine you and I buy two identical motor cars. Let's say they're both Tesla uh, motor cars, exactly the same color. They come off the production line one after another. And let's say you're a super careful driver and I'm just Mr. Chaos and I'm bouncing around and denning it left, right and center. But these cars, we both come back after one month using the cars and we show them. And Jim Tor says, show me how you got the dents in this car precisely. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and, and this is kind of like saying, show me the history that you've gone through versus you've gone through. And this right. is where the emergence of life is actually a natural phenomenon driven by selection. You start with a primordial soup, which, by the way, should stay in all the textbooks. There's nothing wrong with it. What may be interesting is talk about the time scale and the way selection occurs. What we don't know yet is whether selection occurs over multiple primordial soups. What we don't know yet is if the origin of life is a one-off event or you have many different life forms of primitive chemistry. And my guess right now, it's just a guess, is that life became super, super primitive that allowed molecules to exist over time in these soups and they got more complicated, but they weren't autonomous. So what that meant is every time they got disturbed in some way, maybe, maybe there was a meteorite hitting the planet or maybe the temperature changed, that the molecules in effect were unable to, to carry on replicating into the future. In effect, there was a no local extinction event. So that life form is dead. But from out, but then it tries again. And because it gets further in, it has time, it tries something different. And there's competition. Before you get to the first kind of information systems, maybe viruses came before cells, maybe viruses in soap bubbles together were the primitive cells that were then functioning. And all the time, the chemistry of biology that was able to effectively evolve, say this again, chemistry of biology is able to effectively evolve, was effectively curating and refining. And you see this type of evolution again and again in languages, in technologies, in culture, all the time, where people throw away redundant words, things that are too clumsy to spell, and chemicals that systems can't remember to make. And so it's true that actually the, the solution to life on Earth, RNA, uh, peptides, uh, the way that we have our sugars, their handedness, the configuration of organelles in the cell, um, is not hardwired into the entire universe. It's hardwired to the history of chemistry on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. And what we'll show in, a, in some period of time, now that we understand the force of selection can be quantified, um, mm -hmm. is that we will start to see 
new life-like things. And what I think will be exciting is the origin of life community is validating, like, how do we make these molecules? What are the constraints? So I, again, and you did a very good job of um, clarifying that the origin of life is a scam tweet was a tongue-in-cheek on Twitter. I say lots of things on Twitter that are yep. basically um, kind of fun, one glass of wine too many, and this is a cool idea, what I've just thought of. Because yep. after all, I'm a human being who has ideas, most of which are not very good. You were not but declaring the, your entire field that you work in a scam. That's it. Yeah, yeah. And so, and I clarified that with Jim a number of times, and he keeps saying it. And there's going to be a point at which I have to just get a cease and desist and say, if you keep purposefully making stuff up, I am going to basically suggest with the legal means that you stop that. Because, you know, saying saying this when I corrected it on the record, but that's by the by. Oh, that's, <laughs> it's an interesting smokescreen because the origin of life scientists are thinking of a very dedicated, um, impressive set of synthetic endeavors. I'm trying to start at the base and kind of work out how to meet them in the middle. And they're coming back. And then the, the area of systems chemistry that you talk about a lot, the area of kind of chemical biology, which is coming down a lot, and the area that we're developing are coming together. And we're going to see lots of very fruitful overlaps. Yep. And there's lot, lots of reasons for doing this science, this science. I think there's going to be hidden prebiotic soups in the cell that might help us understand how to treat disease. We might understand the, 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 the chemicals that give rise to cancer within the cell that helps, uh, that enable, that is responsible with aging for dysregulation to give rise to kind of miscopying um, of DNA and mistranslation into proteins. There's so, so, so many profound reasons for doing the science. And also, we want to find aliens. Who doesn't want a good alien uh, to be found and, yeah. and to find a new life form? Well, will the discrepancies be, will they have all D amino acids? Will they have amino acids at all? Will they have some other? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> hopefully that will happen when our, within our lifetime. Who knows? The other thing that I did when I looked at this is I went and looked at a load of his claims in his research. He said, in X, we will make transistors, we'll make molecular computers, we'll make all this stuff. Has he done it? Of course yeah. not. <laughs> and, and so when he then says, oh, they claim all this, I'm, of course, scientists want to get funding. They want to put their best foot forward and they want to explain the significance of why they're trying to do the work. And, mm. and perhaps you know, we are all mistaken for claiming, you know, and I did say, you know, I said in that TED talk, um, where, where after the end, when Chris Anderson said, you know, how long would you take? I said, I think it's a couple of years. I stand by that. Now, what I actually said is that once we've worked out what's going on, it should take a couple of, it should be super fast. That's what I meant. So I hope that one day soon I'll be able to say, I think we understand the phenomenon that drives complexification in chemistry. Let's do a two year long experiment and see what we get. And it, it might, might, might work. My, my worry is that the two years turns into 200 million years, but I don't think so. And the way you can turn time into space is by doing lots of combinatorial reactions and using selection. So I think it's very possible to make fast progress. But I think what's even more important is to have an open field to bring in young people, mm -hmm. curious people, people with problems, um, scientific problems, people that are curious to find out how the cell works, people that are curious to find out how the molecules of biology that we are working with. So that, you know, take Sutherland and Pound and Shostak and, um, uh, and, and Ben and Joyce and so on. And there's loads of other people to say, hey, how are you on? They're kind of doing a bit of what I would call molecular archaeology. Yeah. And and that and that. Oh, sorry. What I would call it, uh, ke the chemical, the molecular biology of chemical biology, because they're trying to find out what happens. A bit like finding an archaeological artifact and oh, is this part yeah. of a spear and this stuff. Finding out what happened is a slightly different process from figuring out what is possible. Right. There's exactly. there's slightly different uh, exactly lines of inquiry. Yeah. And so, and so anyway, so I'm going to cease engaging with Jim, you know, I, I, I don't wish him any ill, but personally, but I do wish he would stop making stuff up and def just disenfranchising people's ability to think critically. This is the reason why I went to Harvard. 
This is the reason why I'm engaging with you. You try to get people to think critically and for themselves. You have a style to do it. That's fine. But I think the most important thing is you're like, hey, here's the counterpoint. Think critically. Think for yourself. You come to the conclusion. Mm -hmm. And and then hopefully, you know, it's a bit like the First Amendment, right? The, it, it, I would love everyone to have the First Amendment for critical thinking because that's what's going to keep humanity generating new technologies. And I, you know, a lot of the people that are invoking these God of the Gaps arguments, they don't give up their mobile phones. They don't refuse to use technology. Mm -hmm. They're happy to use what science and technology gives them. They, yeah. but, but yet they're, de they're denying the, the research that gives the origin of life, yet they quite happily tell, take fiber act optics, frame dragging of satellites in orbit and, um, and medical diagnostics. It's bizarre. Yeah, it's insane. Um, fortunately, all this drama, I feel, has like uh, brought the field of origin of life research to the attention of a lot of science-minded people, so I'm happy about that. Um, to go back to the challenge, we we didn't do points four and five, Four was specified information, which is creationist propaganda, not real science. And then five was uh, assembly of a cell. So any comments there? If you yeah, if, no, I, like, I did, I did kind of, but let me go back. So what I meant was when the when you have the soup, <laughs> when the soup starts to basically uh, may starts to maintain its persistence in time, you have a minimal framework that gives you some kind of information content. But the, but the reason I didn't engage with the specified information is that term is like, I don't know what they mean, uh, but what I know is that the origin, the origin of life requires selection. Selection worked in such a way in a network to produce persistence of objects that would normally decay and die or be burned to be um, sustained in time. Now, there's a, there is a competition between the, the system being erased and the system being created. And as and so there is therefore a tension for um, for evolution to try and provide a little bit of extra robustness, but also maintain that information. And that all happens in the molecular recognition and the molecular constitution. So the constant. So it's the other way around to what to what Jim says. It is the very primitive cell that started like a blob. There was an inside and an outside. Because as soon as you have an inside, chemicals can go out inside and be protected from the harsh environment. Their stability is longer. Great. Then they can then start to react in networks. And then when those networks are able to be copied from one set of dressing blob to the other, that is suddenly the genesis of information. Because suddenly the information in one blob can help the information in another blob to survive. And that carries on as the chemistry becomes more specified, that then invents RNA, uh, proteins, sugars, metabolism. So it's kind of happens, he put that one as cell as last because he thought it was the hardest. Ironically, it's probably one of the first things that has to happen because if you just have a big primordial soup with lots of, pop, with lots of molecules, you just get it diluted out. And so you need concentration mineral surfaces, so no, Absolutely, there's ways to produce information content in cells. Absolutely, there's ways to build information systems. Then those systems basically are it coupled intimately to the chemistry. And, I, and so they go up in layers. And what we might likely find in the primordial soup, and maybe even in the cell, if we look hard enough, I make a prediction that there might be some archaeology to do inside the cell where we find the remnants, very primitive, um, metabolism that has information catalysis together in the same chemistry that is somehow now being just, you know, co-opted in, say, the citric acid cycle or some other stuff. But I'm yet to really think about how we how we boot that up in the absence of the cell. And that's really interesting because there is something there that we don't know yet because we can't yet facsimile cells without having some of the constituents. Mm -hmm. And that is a hint not of divine intervention, but non-genomically encoded chemistry that copies itself at the base layer inside life, which is so mind-blowing. Yeah. Of course, by cell, he means a modern bacterium, but uh, that's uh, that's another, another... Yeah, but I mean, it can um, be... 
Yeah, I, it's not it, that it can mean anything, right? It needs to have an inside and an outside and some specificity. So uh, here we we we've done it. Lee Cronin, one of the ten scientists named uh, in the in James Tour's challenge. At the very least, we have confirmed that prebiotic polypeptide and polynucleotide formation is not a problem. At the very 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 least, um, and uh, how his DK and three prime five prime nonsense is irrelevant. So James, uh, delete all your content, please, <laughs> as was promised. <laughs> so that's what Lee had to say. We can resoundingly confirm that Jim's challenge was totally meaningless, which is why nobody responded to him, and the interview with Hector was nothing more than a stunt to keep the deception going. As for assembly theory, if Hector is able to publish his criticism in a reputable journal, it will be for the scientific community to discuss, and I have no role in that. But to say these things to Jim's audience of brainwashed idiots who don't understand a single word that is being said and only want to hear that Lee Cronin is a fraud is very infantile and sleazy. Other than that, I can only point out again that he didn't say a single word about Jim's idiotic challenge or anything concrete whatsoever about anything James has ever said on this topic. He didn't actually defend James in any meaningful scientific way, like the title claims. James is just capitalizing on drama to pretend he's winning something. He isn't. And he also exposes himself as a massive hypocrite for criticizing Lee's approach to the round table. Right. So, so, and, and th this is what happened in the debate. He opened himself up and he says, you know, I may be wrong. I'm just throwing the ideas out there. But what you're saying is when he's before a group of scholars, that's, that's the, what he'll say. But when he is speaking to, to non-experts, he portrays this quite differently. That sounds pretty familiar, sort of like how James portrays himself as an expert in abiogenesis despite being utterly clueless and boldly lies through his teeth to audiences of brainwashed Christians, but then at Harvard is quiet as a mouse, desperately trying to cover up his inappropriate anti-science rhetoric. Now, there is actually a bit more to discuss here. I got a request on LinkedIn from a fellow named Andrew Barron. He used to work at Rice and is a former colleague of James, and he told me that he had some very revealing stories to share over video chat. Some of the more amusing bits involved James refusing to pay his graduate students after their third year, hijacking a colleague's funeral and turning it into a religious sermon, and other shockingly despicable behavior. But the part that was most relevant to what James is trying to pull right now was a very clear articulation of not just hype on his part, but outright plagiarism. That's right, James Tour, who with the help of Hector Zenel is accusing Lee Cronin of plagiarism and hype, is himself guilty of plagiarism and hype. Sadly, Andrew requested that I not share the actual video chat for reasons I did not fully understand, saying that I may quote him instead. But with the information and papers he gave me, I will easily be able to outline for you exactly what James did, and once it's completely clear, I will follow that with quotes from Andrew to confirm everything in his own words. So if you look at Jim's list of publications, there is a paper on CO2 capture published in Nature in 2014, which was later retracted. And wouldn't you know, it was retracted after Andrew Barron, at that time a professor emeritus of chemistry at Rice, dismissed the claims contained in that paper. In order to understand what this paper is about, we have to know that natural gas, although considered the cleanest and most efficient fossil fuel source, is contaminated with carbon dioxide. Venting this gas to the atmosphere increases overall greenhouse emissions and offsets the advantage of using methane over conventional gasoline. Therefore, there are major research efforts to trap this CO2 in a variety of ecologically acceptable ways. So James was funded by the Apache Corporation to design new solid absorption materials, and in 2014, he published this paper. In it, he claimed to have made highly porous N or S doped carbon materials with exceptional trapping power for CO2. But his approach to making these materials was not new. For example, take a look at figure one. The S-doped polymeric materials he's describing here had already been made previously by other researchers using identical activating treatment, which was heating at 600 degrees Celsius in the presence of potassium hydroxide. 
Absolutely equivalent chemistry is described in these other papers. First, here is one by Sevilla and Fuertes, published two years prior. James described his use of polythiophenes. These researchers also describe the use of polythiophenes with precisely the same methodology. Here are some electron microscope images of their materials and a table of the various materials they tested. This was not new research either. Here is another paper of theirs from the year before, about similar nitrogen-doped materials, again for CO2 capture. Then there is another paper by Chandra et al. from 2012, using similar materials as the previous paper, again for CO2 capture. These materials showed solid CO2 uptake of 0.11 to 0.19 grams CO2 per gram of sorbent at one bar of pressure. Jim's material, unsurprisingly, displayed the same properties at one bar, showing sorption levels of 0.14 to 0.19 grams CO2 per gram of sorbent. So, as you can see, James did absolutely nothing new here. He didn't develop any new materials. His polythiophenes had already been made and tested for this precise purpose. He didn't show elevated levels of CO2 uptake. The numbers were identical to previous research because his methodology was identical to previous research. We know for a fact that he copied existing methodology because he does reference it, but only for the experimental part, neglecting to discuss any of the actual content. And yet, despite all of this, James made much more extravagant claims than the previous authors. Here at the end of the paper, he states that his work was a major advance for future capture and possibly storage of this greenhouse gas. Was it really though, James, or would this be an example of hype? You know, the hype that you constantly attribute to origin of life research? The 2012 paper by Fuertes was published in a relatively obscure journal, Microporous and Mesoporous Materials. It has an impact factor of 5.2, which is fair, but not great. Nature, on the other hand, has an impact factor of 64.8. Of course, the use of high impact journals increases one's visibility and all the metrics used to determine it, like H index and citation numbers. You know, those numbers James is always bragging about? Building up his own statistics by publishing plagiarized work in more prestigious journals, beyond simply slapping his name on the work of his 30-plus graduate students, does that sound like a whole flaming heap of hype? Now, one might logically ask how James was able to take some work which had no elements of novelty and get it published in the most prestigious journal in science. Aside from poor refereeing, the trick was to propose that nitrogen and sulfur bases at high pressures were able to polymerize CO2, and this created a particularly stable form of CO2, which was easier to store. This proposal was based on some spectroscopic data, especially a band in the infrared spectrum which was assigned to the carbon-oxygen double bond of the alleged polymeric CO2, as well as a peak in the 13C NMR spectrum, also assigned to the carbonyl carbon of the polymer. Looking at figures 3, E, and F shows that the idea was that the doping atom, nitrogen or sulfur, would attack CO2 at the carbonyl and this would trigger polymerization. That's where Andrew Barron comes in. Prompted by suspicions about Jim's research, Andrew suggested in a subsequent article that such polymerization is unlikely and theoretically implausible. The polymerization requires the presence of a Lewis acid, but none was found experimentally in the system. The first sentence of his introduction references Jim's paper, and he is basically outright stating that James did not get poly-CO2. The controversy might have died at this point if the problem had been of only academic interest, but the Apache Corporation wanted to patent the invention if there was really anything new to patent, and requested confirmation of the data, especially the spectroscopic data supporting this unlikely poly-CO2. The data could not be repeated as the peaks proved to be artifacts of the experiment, and James had to formally retract the paper. Plagiarism, hype, and fraud all wrapped up in one pathetic stunt. Alright, so hopefully I was able to make this debacle relatively clear for everyone. Let's hear the exact same story from Andrew now. This first quotation will be very long because he's explaining everything I just told you. It's long enough that I won't read it all aloud, but I'll highlight key bits. Feel free to pause the video as we go and read it at your own pace. And remember, this isn't dumb old Dave who can't read papers. The ridiculous defense mechanism James and his brainwashed flock use when they want to deny any paper. I use to prove James wrong. These are direct quotes from Andrew Barron, who was Professor Emeritus of Chemistry at Rice University at that time. And here we go. So, as you can see, James and Andrew were both being funded by Apache and were having meetings with Apache while they were both at Rice. James hyped up some work he had been doing for them. 
Andrew and his postdoc smell something fishy and confirm that James had blatantly plagiarized some existing work on carbon capture. Andrew tries to bring this to Jim's attention, but he tries to convince everyone that his work is special based on a fraudulent or at least erroneous claim of having produced polymeric CO2 based on an NMR spectrum he had interpreted incorrectly. If you remember his misadventures with Stephen Benner's NMR spectra, it does seem like James needs to go back for some undergraduate classes in this area as it's getting quite embarrassing for him. Again, Andrew tries to reason with Jim, but he's such a delusional narcissist that he refuses to learn anything and insists he's going to get a Nobel Prize for this garbage. So Andrew publishes a paper proving James wrong, shows Apache that James is totally full of it, so they drop the patent and James has to withdraw the paper. Again, plagiarism, hype, and fraud all wrapped up in one pathetic stunt. Would you like it summarized by Andrew a little more succinctly and clearly? This is how he wrapped up this story, and since it's shorter, I'll read it aloud. Well, it's always the hype, because everything Jim did had to be in science or nature, but some of it was like, as I say, was essentially identical to something someone had done before. And then he would claim that, oh, this is the best absorbent that's ever been made, blah, 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 blah. And it turned out, well, no, it isn't. You know, but he would claim it and somehow get his buddies to accept it in the best journals, you know. So that's an example you can quote me on, because I published the paper that refutes his work. And also, you go and look up his retraction of the paper, which he fudged why it was retracted, but it was retracted because it was plagiarized bullshit, basically. Or half of it was plagiarized, and the other half was complete bullshit. Some of you out there might have it in you to be extra charitable to James. Maybe he just wasn't aware of the existing research on carbon capture. That would be very irresponsible of him, and make him a complete fool who has no idea how to examine existing literature before planning his research, but it would absolve him of plagiarism. Okay, fine. And maybe James is truly just an idiot who can't read an NMR spectrum, and he really did think he had produced something miraculous with the help of Jesus, which would absolve him of the fraudulent claims. Okay, fine. But has he done this sort of thing before? Has he done this sort of thing many, many times before? Let's ask Andrew what he thinks. It's also interesting, if you track his publications, he bounces around from different areas, and he comes in claiming he solved the problem of MRI imaging or whatever it is, and then everyone in the industry or in the field realizes he's not, and then he goes into something else. So he was spending a lot of time on nanotubes for cancer treatment, where he claimed all these great things, and then all the people in the med center over at Baylor and MD Anderson basically worked out that it was all bullshit, and then suddenly he wasn't really doing that anymore, and he'd go off and do oil and gas, and then the oil and gas industry would realize that it was all complete bullshit, and then he'd go off and do something else. This new wave he has on criticizing people for hype, you know, he's the king of hype. I mean, he's the absolute king of hype. You could cite a series of papers of his which are the absolute epitome of hype, and then you realize there's no real subsequent follow-up papers. It kind of disappears. And that, to me, is the opposite of my postdoc supervisor used to call it Sherman's March. You know, when you get a really great result, you then publish everything in the field to burn the ground, and no one else can come into your field because you've published 20 papers, which basically have done everything. Jim never does that. He does one paper, claims it's the best thing since sliced bread, and then does maybe one more, and that's it. So it seems like James pretty much exclusively operates this way. This is probably the most revealing insight into the psychology of James that I've uncovered thus far. The way he presents himself. Look at all these patents. Look at all of these areas of science that he has contributed to. Breakthrough after breakthrough. When in reality, he's had virtually none. He jumps from one field to another when he can't fool people any longer, and he is constantly plagiarizing existing work to publish in higher profile journals, which boost his visibility, so all of the bragging about his list of publications and his H index go right out of the window as well. I used to think that James was a good scientist in his own field who allowed his religion to warp his mind and push an anti-science agenda in other fields that challenges baseless faith. Now I realize that the truth is much worse. He perceives himself as an extension of his own mythological savior, bringing forth the glory of the Lord through his magnificent gift of scientific brilliance. But he's really just a sad little man who lies and cheats his way to the middle, only to complain when people don't recognize him as the fictional superstar he pretends to be.
With this very eye-opening realization about who James really is, how can James be forgiven for using Hector Zenil to accuse Lee Cronin of all these things that he knows full well he has done himself? Did Andrew Barron make a YouTube video to publicly denounce James Tour as a fraud for an audience of laypeople who have no idea what he's talking about? No, he settled the science in the primary literature, like a scientist. But James isn't a scientist anymore, if he ever truly was one at all. He's a two-bit apologist grifter who will use any shady tactic at his disposal to tear down anyone who dares speak out against his idiotic claim that we are clueless about the origin of life, because that's all he has left. In the end, this is what James and the Discovery Institute have to resort to. Their laughable script of lies has been so thoroughly exposed, time and time again, by myself and others. With no ability to defend themselves scientifically, they must resort to slander and conspiracy. Whether it's James recruiting a mediocre scientist like Hector to accuse Lee of fraudulence, or the DI slandering me with multiple accusations of anti-Semitism, this is all they have. These character assassinations are the desperate acts of charlatans who have had their good Christian charade shattered and their hypocrisy exposed. The one thing they do have, however, is tenacity. Take a look at James. He makes a series, I demolish it. He makes a much more desperate series, I obliterate it. We debate, he gets humiliated. He runs to Harvard, he gets humiliated some more. Now he tries to throw out accusations of hype and plagiarism only to have his own hype and plagiarism highlighted to a far greater degree. For someone who thinks he is on a righteous crusade for Jesus, he must be wondering why his Lord has forsaken him so. Well, James, since you love your Bible so much, here's a nice passage for you to meditate on. Matthew 7, 5. You, hypocrite, first take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So that's it for James King Hype Tour and his latest round of damage control, an attempted bombshell that just backfired right in his face like always. At this point, he's become the Joker to my Batman. Luckily, it makes for great content. I'll see you next time.